ஹலோ எவ்ரி ஒன் வெல்கம் டு கா ஹோமியோபதி ஸ்டேடி குரூப் ப்ரோ போன வெபினார் ஹோஸ்டட் பை கவிதா ஹோலிஸ்டிக் அப்ரோச் ஐ வுட் லைக் டு டேக் பிரிவிலேஜ் டு சே தட் அவர் கா ஸ்டேடி குரூப் இஸ் த ஃபர்ஸ்ட் ஹோமியோபதி ப்ரோ போனோ ஸ்டேடி குரூப் ஃப்ரம் த யுனைடெட் ஸ்டேட்ஸ் ஆஃப் அமெரிக்கா விச் ஃபார்ம் டு யுனைட் வேர்ல்ட் ரீனோட் ப்ராக்டிஷனர்ஸ் ஸ்பேனிங் த குளோப் காஸ் மிஷன் அண்ட் விஷன் ஆர் வெரி யூனிக் டு இன்ஸ்பைர் யங் ஹோமியோபத்ஸ் மென்டர் ப்ரொவைட் எக்ஸலன்சி ஃபார் எஜுகேஷனல் பர்பஸஸ் யூஸிங் holistic approaches via webinars we provide professional continuing at homeopathic credit uh, credits that provides the for the practitioners we follow the principles of classical homeopathy and invite speakers for hna accredited webinars we value and treasure the human collective as our honorable peers we provide merit certificates for spreading the light of homeopathy worldwide while celebrating stage 4 cancer survivors through our inspirational book talks these webinars are for educational purposes only and see an expert homeopath for treatment this is kavita kokunur from michigan usa president and ceo of kavita holistic approach i am board certified homeopath and outreach coordinator of chc pr committee encouraging homeopaths to become chc certified i am member of kevin friendly foundation a non profit organization that helps to serve poor people in greater needs in india i thank ka homeopathy study group team for their continuous support this webinar is moderated by ka family dr swetha singh chief administrator professor regina rianelli it is being recorded as we speak and we are live on facebook to receive certificate please kindly fill the jot form provided in the chat voice to support homeopathy our friends said americans for homeopathy choice submitted a petition to the fda to protect homeopathy we need your help it will just take 2 minutes our goal is 1000 comments by december 2nd 2020 currently we have 16000 plus and thank you for all those who have supported this petition and we will provide the uh, link in the chat before i start i would like professor regina to chant gayatri mantra thank you om burbuat swaha tat savitur varenyan bargo devasya jimahi jiyo yona prachodaya many blessings to the universe thank you namaskarams thank you so much professor regina We have learned many things in our previous webinars with Dr. Massimo Mangalwari from Italy, Dr. Divya Chabra from India, and two hour HNA webinar by Dr. Jawharsha on complete clinical guidelines on current pandemic crisis and several remedies we have learned and and uh, it has helped several thousands of people in this current situation. Today we will cover two very important topics from two expert homeopaths. and the topics are opportunity and challenges for homeopathy in covid-19 pandemic experience from india by dr rajman chanda and homeopathic prophylaxis his, its historic roots and relevance for practice today by kathy lemon and we will take questions at the end of the first topic for 5 to 10 minutes and it is great privilege to introduce our honorable speaker dr rajman chanda Dr Raj Manchanda he did his MD in homeopathy and MBA healthcare administration from University of Delhi India with over 35 plus years of experience in professional as a professional and renowned homeopath clinician teacher researcher and administrator Dr Manchanda has a rare insight into policy matters related to homeopathic educational research medicinal products and global affairs formerly he was the director general of central council for research in homeopathy ccrh an apex research organization under ministry of ayush government of india and his honorable phd cyber jaya from university college of medical sciences malaysia an honorable faculty of homeopathy uk author of textbook of dermatology for homeopaths who authored about 150 research publications in peer reviewed journals Ministry of Ayush, Ayurveda, Yoga, Naturopath, Yunani and Arsita and he is the Director General and Secretary of Information and Communication of Liga Medicorium Homeopathica Internationalis. Currently, Director of Ayush, Department of Health and Welfare, Family Welfare, Government of NCT of Delhi. There is so much to say about Dr. Manchanda and it is a great privilege to have him here with us today. And we will also welcome 
Kathy Lemon, our second speaker. Kathy Lemon, who completed her homeopathic studies through several established homeopathic schools in Europe and UK, including specialized training in special homeopathic and other natural healing approaches, all of which help her effectively work with and promote healing and wellness in the clients she sees in her practice. She did her bachelor's in arts and member of Alliance of Registered Homeopaths UK, North American Society of Homeopathy, the National Center for Homeopathy, and Texas Society of Homeopathy. Kathy is certified homeopathic supervisor in homeoprophylaxis and works closely with world authorities in this. She founded the nonprofit Fionzi organization Homeoprophylaxis, a worldwide choice, HPWWC in 2015, and through this has put together international conferences which have taken place in Dallas, Texas, USA, Netherlands, and India. She has lectured and presented throughout the United States and internationally. Mrs. Lemon has articles published in many international magazines, including Homeopathic Links, German Language, Homeopathic Magazine, and many more international online homeopathic magazines. And we welcome Kathy to our webinar. Both of you, so uh, thank you so much for giving us this great privilege. And uh, Dr. Manchanda, would you like to start yours first, please? We welcome you. Thank you, Kavita. First of all, I'm thankful to Kavita. Now we will have um, Kathy Lemon coming up with homeoprophylaxis and with historic uh, history and relevant uh, prevalence of homeoprophylaxis today in USA. And uh, let us welcome Kathy. Thank you. Thank you very much. And <clears throat> Dr. Manchanda, it was wonderful to hear you speaking again. So much wonderful information you shared uh, that's going to be beneficial to so many people. Uh, so, yeah, so I, I guess I'm just going to kind of dive in, I guess, to where, where I'm at um, and what I'm going to share. This is a presentation that I've uh, been able to share in, in many avenues, but every time I uh, share this, there's more that I want to share. There's different things that I want to uh, emphasize, things that I don't realize that I don't need to say anymore. But uh, in any case, Kavitha, thank you so much for inviting me to um, present here as well. I'm, I'm just, I'm very honored to be a part of this, to, to be able to do what I do, to be able to share what I share, because what I want more than anything else is for people within homeopathy to understand what we have within homeopathy, but also more than that for people outside of homeopathy to really understand the strong yet gentle approach that we have uh, within homeopathy. So there we go. This is <clears throat> who I am and I guess my organization right now, if you haven't heard, uh, is this homeoprophylaxis, a worldwide choice for disease prevention or simply HPWWC. And I'm very, very honored to have this organization, which has become a nonprofit organization, um, because the passion that I have about homeoprophylaxis is simply for the world to know that there is a non toxic and very effective, very proven um, option for disease prevention that, that, that we need to know about, that we need to consider, that we need to understand that it's not something that is new, that is just bounced up in retaliation to uh, what's commonly used in. in um, conventional medicine today. No, no, no. This is something that has basically, as Dr. Manchanda um, alluded to and, and even spoke about, it, it's what helped homeopathy become known as how, how effective it works as a prophylactic. Now, in, in light of the current event, the, the COVID-19 that is on everybody's mind right now, um, I just want to let you know, I'm not going to be talking a lot specifically about it. Now, this is something that, I, uh, that I've been changing with every time that I've been, I've been honored to present this, but here are some homeopathic uh, resources and just uh, Dr. Manchana uh, let us know of a, yet another one uh, that we can um, resource. Can we turn off the, the, our, our volumes? There? It's kind of distracting other people there, but in any case, uh, Dr. Manchanda shared with the Indian Journal of Homeopathic Medicine that, that has their, their COVID uh, focus now too. But here's a couple of recorded uh, things that, we can, that you can pull up to learn more about homeopathic approaches, things that have been done homeopathically related to the COVID-19. Here's a couple of free articles. Uh, 
available right on, on hpathy.com by Dr. Golden uh, and by Dr. Sankaran, whom we know. And then here's a couple of publications. Uh, here's, and I need to add the Indian one to this as well too. The American Journal of Homeopathic Medicine has a free e-issue that you can access there. And I have just recently uh, got uh, the publication from the um, Alliance of Registered Homeopaths that's focused on the, on the COVID-19. It's got some brilliant articles in it uh, as well. But what I really like to approach, and I think what really gives us a firm foundation of things within homeopathy, is to know history, to know how things have changed through history, but to know as well that um, some things are not going to change because they're true. They're, they're firm. Knowing history helps us actually learn from it so and, and improve where we are today so that humanity is there with improved. That is what we need to be mindful of for what we have in homeopathy. Uh, as well, here's something just a little bit about truth. Hardly anything is actually proven. Almost everything is simply assumptions. The biggest error in every field of science is the fact that so-called knowledge is nothing more than a current theory or model of thought. How many years did people think that the, that, that the earth was the center of the universe, you know, how many, how long do we think that the edge of the horizon was just a cutoff that it didn't go around? You can think of so many things, even from Hanuman's time till today. Uh, things have changed because man's knowledge has expanded. So let's keep that in mind. And this is a brilliant quote uh, shared by James Burnett uh, in, in his book uh, about about Thuya that we're probably familiar with. Vaccination, vaccinosis and it's cured by Thuya. Here's how he addresses truth. Truth is not truth, save only to the infinite. To the mind of mortal man, truth is not necessarily truth, but only that which appears to be true. Hence it is that what is a glorious truth to one man is inglorious nonsense to another. And both individuals may be equally honest of purpose or of like earnestness in their search for truth. So let's keep that in mind as we proceed here today. Uh, here's a quote by a brilliant homeopath you may have heard of, uh, Dr. Arthur Grimmer. It is our duty to invite physicians of all schools of healing to test fully the homeopathic art of protection against epidemic diseases. If such tests were honestly made by sincere men of all schools of healing, homeopathy would reach its place in the sun. And so again, that's what I really hope to present to all of you here, that homeopathy has a very, very strong foundation as far as prophylaxis, as far as prevention. It is there. It is solid. So let's look just a little bit about the idea of vaccination. I do not and I will not consider myself anti-vax, that term that's so widely used. No, what is very valuable to understand, though, is the um, history that's behind it all. Edward Jenner, 1749 to uh, 1823, the word vaca, vaccination, comes from the Latin word for cow. Uh, not surprisingly, um, cowpox is how it, how it began through the uh, 1800s, though the vaccine pox, and you find that actually in uh, Compton's book here, uh, vaccine pox is the word uh, that they use for cowpox. So again, that was uh, his, his invention for Jenner was taking the uh, cowpox and potentizing it for lack of a better term and using that as a prevention for uh, smallpox. Well, we're not gonna get into a big discussion over that. I just want you to understand uh, also a, a few things that were happening that again, Jenna gets into in his book and this has gotten into it uh, through another book that I've gotten, Horse Grease. You may be familiar with this. This was found by Jenner himself to be more appropriate than the cow. Uh, so he used this uh, more of this horse grease, which is a, I live on a small farm, we have a horse and hopefully we'll never see horse grease on our horse. <clears throat> it's, a, it's a very, very bad disease. It gets on the legs of a horse. Uh, but he used this more of this uh, for the vaccine for smallpox than actually the cowpox. 
Uh, same thing with with goat pox. There's actually a goat. We've got more goats on our farm than cows. Uh, than, than <laughs> let me get all these animal traits. We have more goats on our farm than a horse. Um, but in any case, it's very very interesting to study this all because we have a homeopathic remedy called Melandrium, which is made from horse grease, which has actually been shown to be uh, quite effective for smallpox. Now, uh, Tuya, let's remember this too. Compton's work on Tuya, let's keep in mind as far as homeopathy, and we'll get more and more into this. Homeopathy, of course, as we all know, is not a one-size-fits-all remedy. Tuya and Dr. Golden gets into this quite a bit, is very effective uh, as a prophylactic for smallpox, not for everything not for everything. A lot of people think we want prevention, let's just use Tuya. No, 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 no. Tuya is very, uh, very effective for uh, smallpox. And then we build from there. So let's look at this. Uh, because I live in the United States, I just, and I love history, I just wanted to here to also share a little bit about relevant homeopathic history, primarily from the United States. It was brought, homeopathy was brought here uh, in the early 19... Let me say this correctly. Homeopathy was very big in the U.S. until the early 1900s. It was uh, brought to the U.S. in the early 1820s. Okay, we had homeopathic hospitals, homeopathic universities, and I love to say this, there were more than a thousand homeopathic pharmacies. Okay, in, in the small country that the United States was at this time. The American Institute of Homeopathy is the oldest medical organization in the United States. It was established in 1844. And interesting to know that uh, that was a couple of years before the American Medical Association. The American Medical Association was indeed established in reaction to the American Institute of Homeopathy, the AIH. Okay, the Homeopathic Pharmacopeia of the United States, or the HPUS, it has been in continuous publication since 1897. I've recently spoken with the head, uh, head scientists with the HPUS. They are quite passionate about staying on top of things homeopathic in the United States. It was a homeopath who helped establish the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. And this was uh, something that I found very interesting, too. And, and Dr. Manchanda uh, when I put together the Indian conference for homeoprophylaxis, a worldwide choice, I was able to get to know Dr. Manchanda quite well. I, I was able to put together a meeting between him and an attorney with whom I work uh, quite closely with over here by the name of Jim Turner. Jim Turner, who loves the nation of India, uh, he shared, and I didn't realize this, but apparently um, the current Indian medical program was patterned directly after the FDA, following the, the 1933 Eight FDCA documentation. It used to be known as the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. And it's very interesting. You can pull up those two documents and see how very, very similar they are. There's a lot of um, similarities between what is here in the United States and what's here in, in, in India. Now, it was said many times at the New Delhi Conference for HPWWC that India is now setting the standard for the world as far as homeopathy. And I can tell you this, from what I saw in India, the homeopaths, the homeopathic facilities, the many, many, many people there that were seeking homeopathic help for their situations, from what I saw there, I do sincerely believe this. So let's look at this defining of disease. And you never want to define a disease when you're in the middle of a problem with, uh, regarding that disease. You don't want to define anything when it's a, a current issue. Okay, so I looked uh, at Webster's Medical Dictionary. It defines disease simply as this, sickness or ailment caused by germs or viruses with consistent results. Seems pretty simple. But a aphorism eight, let's look at things homeopathically. Disease is, this is what Hahnemann says, a state of being of the organism dynamically untuned by a disturbed vital force, an alteration of the state in the state of health. And he shares, he, he had a little bit of a disagreement with one of the chief, um, well, chief head and past authority of the old school, Christoph Wilhelm Friedrich Hufeland, who said homeopathy can remove the symptoms, but the disease still remains. Hahnemann basically said, that's nonsense. When the body is well, it is well. We're going to get more into that. In, in aphorism 9, Hahnemann also shares health is this in the state of health, the spirit-like vital force or dynamis and, uh, animating the material human 
organism reigns in supreme sovereignty. It maintains the sensations and activities of all the parts of the living organism in a harmony that obliges wonderment. The reasoning spirit who inhabits the organism can thus freely use this healthy living instrument to reach the lofty goal of human existence. Homeopathy looks at health a whole lot deeper. Okay, health and illness, aphorism 11 gets further into what is disease, how it acts. He has a brilliant comparison. I love to read this, how he compares uh, the rotation of the planet, the moon, and its effect on tides. Uh, as a, there, There's a magnetic, a magnetic force to this, how these, he talks about how these really all act dynamically without being seen. He explains further about the effectiveness of homeopathic potentization and how he sees this work in it. And as, as Dr. Manchanda referenced to, it's just brilliant that he didn't have the resources, the, 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 the microscopes, all, the, all, the, uh, all what we have today, but yet he saw all this and it reigns, it still is true. But what I find very, very helpful to understand is these two primary schools of thought that have gone back and forth as far as which is predominant through history, clear back to at least um, Hippocrates' time, okay? The empirical school and the rational school, the body. How do we view the body? Well, the empirical school sees it has an energetic essence, a vital force, chi, life force, a balance. Homeostasis or equilibrium, that's what we're searching for. The rational school sees the body as material, mechanical entity. There are external forces which majorly impact the physical being. Okay, beyond this, knowledge. We see knowledge in the empirical school is found through practice, historical context. It's discovered through clinical practice, gained through studying people in their lives. There's a doctrine of cure by natural law, of in, uh, knowledge of internal systems is impossible and is not required for a cure. Whereas in the rational school, knowledge is said to be found on experimenting on dead organisms or living organisms in a laboratory setting. It's discovered in the labs. It's gained through phys uh, physiological study of how sick or healthy organisms function. Knowledge of internal systems is required for treatment. Now, please do keep in mind, I don't want to say one is should be shunned <laughs> and the other focused on. No, we, you can tell already, of course, which school of thought is the predominant one today. And there are definite, definite pluses that have happened because of this. Okay, and so let's just keep in mind just simply the difference that we're, we have between the empirical school and the rationalist, rational school, okay? How we view disease, in the empirical school, we see it as a derangement of or imbalance of the vital energy of the person. And in the rational school, disease is seen as signs, symptoms that are considered statistically abnormal. And view of symptoms, okay? Holistic in the empirical school, we observe the physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual levels. Uh, the organism's the symptoms are the organism's effort to heal a person. The body's call for help, I like to call it that. Uh, Whereas in the rationalist school, symptoms are seen in a reductionist manner. They're, they usually happen with use of physiochemical terminology, uh, so, uh, psychological problems seen as something different to assess and vice versa, uh, indications of something wrong inside the body. And the cause of disease, pretty simple. We, we, we see the, within the empirical school, proximate causes, close to result, are not the cause of disease. These are the other, there, there are other effects. These are not important to therapies that seek to raise resistance. These are specific internal cause. The specific internal cause of disease is always unknown. And environmental influ influences can be stressors, but internal predispositions, e.g. miasms, make the person more susceptible in the first place. Hahnemann was grasping this. How long ago? Whereas cause of disease in the rational school, proximate causes are, they say what caused the disease, such as internal material, chemical, mechanical, or biological causes. The causes indeed, they say, can be known. And often external agents such as a virus, bacteria, environment, 
can, can be uh, considered to be the cause of disease. So very different uh, approaches, and I would encourage you to, to, pull, uh, to find a copy of Harris Coulter's book, Divided Legacy, where you can read about this even further. Uh, and let's look specifically at a few of Hahnemann's words in this regard. Aphorism 100, every epidemic disease, he says, presents a new disease. We must know the unique symptoms within each epidemic to ascertain the proper homeopathic approach, except for those, and Hahnemann mentions these specifically, caused by some unvarying infections. These include, and he mentions again specifically, measles and smallpox. Why? Because they present the same symptoms every time. A from 240, he expounds further on this, that we need to seek to find an epidemic's own consistent nature common to the individuals affected. We must never allow presumption to override observation. And for instance, 101 and 2, uh, he expounds further on finding what we term today as the genus epidemicus. And I like to point this out too in the uh, American Journal of Homeopathic Medicine that I referenced earlier. Uh, Dr. Joel Shepard uh, points out that uh, this is often said from Hahnemann, but actually it was, it, this phrase is actually attributed to a J.G. Rademacher, a contemporary of Hahnemann who never accepted homeopathic axioms. So it makes sense to uh, use this term genus epidemicus, but we got, we got to realize that it was coined by a, <laughs> a non-homeopath. So uh, as we look further at this, let's look at what we do in homeopathy. We look at the totality of the symptoms. We make careful, meticulous assessments. Uh, this is how homeopathy, homeopaths have been approaching diseases and epidemics since Hahnemann's time. This is why homeopathic researchers are still so carefully, fully, attentively researching people in situations in epidemics and pandemics today, more than 200 years later. <clears throat> especially today with COVID-19, as, as you've heard, especially again, Dr. Manchanda addressing. These are fundamental homeopathic principles. So let's look at homeoprophylaxis, its roots. Okay, it is deeply embedded within homeopathy. And you, you find this, first of all, I would reference you to, to the lesser writings of Samuel Hahnemann. He has a letter in there, The Cure and Prevention of Scarlet Fever, written in 1801. These uh, refer to events happen, happening in 1799 in Königsluther, Germany. Hahnemann refers to scarlet fever as a devastating scourge. And he goes into much detail about how what he was observing as far as uh, the symptoms that were being presented about uh, from, from the scarlet fever. He even explains much of what he understands understood about contagious disease even in 1799, okay, where he talks about, in this letter, he talks about a washerwoman who had a towel uh, that must have been uh, on someone who was affected because now someone else is getting it and another child is getting it. It's very, very fascinating to read about how much detail he was able to share about what he was seeing about uh, scarlet fever. He explained the symptoms he was seeing, noting that they, these symptoms were very first well-treated homeopathically with prepared opium. But then he noted that these were even better treated with homeopathically prepared belladonna. And he, and he noted very much a lot of success through the treatment of, of, of those of like, of, Affected with uh, scarlet fever, who were treated with belladonna, and he and he gave them this in very small doses. Please note that for later. Now bring in a large family in Königsluther, the eldest daughter of, of which was already taking belladonna for, and all he says it was an external affection of, on the joints of her fingers. That's as much detail as he describes it there. That's as much as it needs to be. He found this very interesting that she had always been the first to take on an illness or an epidemic, but was not affected by the scarlet fever that three of her siblings had. Scientist Hahnemann took note of this and he took the belladonna and he gave this to the other five children. It was a very large family. The other five children in the family in very small doses, they all remained perfectly well without the slightest symptoms throughout the whole course of the epidemic and amid the most virulent scarlatina emanations from their sisters who lay, who lay ill with the disease. Hanma says this, I reasoned thus, 
a remedy that is capable of quickly checking a disease in its onset must be its preventive. So just a few more of Hahnemann's words in this regard. He says, one of the, my chief aims is to excite a great interest in a subject of so much importance to humanity as this is. Now, knowing that Hahnemann was very much a scientist, while this is what he shares in his Cure and Prevention of Scarlet Fever, I very, very sincerely feel that he was not just talking about only Scarlet Fever, okay? A subject of so much importance to humanity. He also shared this, who can deny that the perfect prevention of infection would offer infinite advantages over any mode of treatment, be it of the most incomparable kind so ever. This is how strongly Hahnemann felt about it. Now, this presents the beginning of his exploration into the prophylactic use of homeopathic medicines. We can find more writings on this through Brenninghausen, through Herring, and again through Burnett. It's, it's something that is just that we need to be familiar with, that we need to explore more fully with today so we understand it. <clears throat> For instance, 33, he makes further mention of the scarlet fever episode by saying this, if medicines can protect us from the contagion of a raging epidemic, they must possess a greater power to alter our vital force than the epidemic. That's how strongly he was feeling about it. He also clearly followed what he shares in the organon. He knew that Belladonna, would likely not have the same effect in subsequent outbreaks of, or epidemics of scarlet fever. He made painstaking observations of what he was seeing. In, in Koenig's letter, letter, he called this the old genuine scarlet fever. But then in another <clears throat> letter that he has in his lesser writings, the observations on scarlet fever, he shares that they, had, they now had a new red miliary fever. Okay, he, he said, as well as Belladonna's working in this one, it's not gonna work in everyone. The individual and the unique case must be taken into consideration every time. And we must never allow presumption to override observation. We've got to be so cautious within homeopathy. And I think as a whole, we really, really are. So the success of Belladonna, going back to just the, the, the prima Belladonna, uh, prima scarlet fever at preventing this, helped Hahnemann uh, and homeopathy gain renown. In 1838, and this is a very significant thing I love to mention, the, Pre the Prussian government called for the use of belladonna for the prevention of scarlet fever, probably with encouragement from the king himself, King Friedrich Wilhelm III, uh, who had encouragement from uh, Hufeland himself. Interesting to note, and I, I, I read this and I'm, I'm still working to find out the source for this, but apparently he, King, king Wilhelm, nearly lost his son who became the next king of Prussia. He nearly lost his son to the smallpox vaccine. So you can imagine how passionate this king was when he learned that there was a non-toxic means of prevention. Of course, I'm gonna promote it, okay? In 1843, the British Journal of Homeopathy in their very first volume has an article on the preservative properties of belladonna and scarlet fever by Francis Black. It's a very brilliant article. It's a compilation of many, many studies, uh, at least 15, uh, sorry, 19 homeopathic physicians gave trial uh, for, for the scarlet fever with belladonna, each of them having a great success. Each of them shared their own approach for it. I would very much encourage you to, to uh, find a copy of this to become more familiar with everything that, that was taking place there. This uh, study was at the time very widely quoted and referenced even in another book that i would very much encourage you to get the logic of figures by william bradford and here's a page from that book page 31 where he's referencing the the article from the british journal um, and, and you can see right there just the very much success that all these people had had all these homeopathic physicians had in the use of this so it's very very well studied and i've even heard it said today too that Technically speaking, homeoprophylaxis is more heavily studied, more uh, thoroughly documented form of, for, form of prophylaxis. So do bear that in mind. But again, back on this, Hahnemann himself, he continued his research into the prophylactic use of homeopathic medicines on cholera. Uh, in his lesser writings, again, too, there's a letter, Cause and Prevention of the Asiatic Cholera. And also you can find that in Brenninghausen's writings, The Cure of Asiatic Cholera and the protection of the same. 
So what we have today is something very, very widely used, very, very widely quoted. Uh, Isaac Golden has a book that has a whole bunch of quotes, but I've just picked out three here um, that that talk about some of the, some of the people that you may have heard of. James Tyler Kent said, "We must look to homeopathy for our protection as well as our cure." And those, these remedies will enable you to prevent a large number of people from becoming sick. Additionally, uh, again, here's Dr. Grimmer again. As the law of similars excels in the power to cure, it excels more forcibly and certainly in the art of disease prevention. And Dr. Do Dorothy Shepard, another brilliant little book that she's written, Homeopathy and Epidemic Diseases. In this book, she says, the homeopathic preventives are much safer in use and absolutely certain in their effects. Even should the, infections, it, the infectious disease develop, it will be in a much milder form. Remember this too, that homeoprophylaxis doesn't offer 100% prevention. No, There's no form of prevention that can offer that. But the studies that I've seen, the studies that are very well quoted by, by many today, show that HP, homeoprophylaxis, HP has an effectiveness standing at right about 90%. So let's, let's keep all this in mind as we proceed. Today, what we have today, there are four primary approaches for homeoprophylaxis. Uh, number one is the homeopathic gold standard of individualization. Now that we know to be very, very effective. However, when you've got something widespread like the COVID-19, it's unfortunately kind of impractical. Okay, so there's another combination remedy, uh, remedy approach. And this is an approach that has also shown to be very, very effective. The problem though is that uh, for this, the symptoms of a given epidemic in specific location needs, uh, need to be known. This is why uh, combination remedies have proven to be so effective in Cuba. Several studies have been phenomenally effective in India using combination remedies. So that, that is another approach for this. Then there's the genus epidemicus uh, approach, which is being shown to be very, very effective. But at the same time, is it has its uh, limitations as well, because what we're finding, especially, and I'll just refer uh, to the COVID-19 with this, what we're finding, and Isaac Golden writes about this too, you can read about that in his article, the genus epidemicus that may be found for India may not be the same as what's found, I'll just say, in the United States or different parts of the United States or even different parts of India or Brazil or you know anywhere in the world. The genus, what we have as far as uh, the COVID-19, we have a, a virus that mutates quite readily. And so this is uh, something to keep in mind with, with that as well, as effective as, as it can be, it has its limitations as well. And then we also have the isopathic nozo remedy approach. This um, approach is really going to be kind of the more readily accepted one because it kind of, uh, in, in a way, it looks like vaccines. But it, but it's, of course, when you understand about nozos, when you understand about what isopathy is, when you understand homeopathic remedies, you understand that what this works on is symptoms, presenting symptoms, and it works on those. But Again, this has been, I look at belladonna with scarlet fever. This has been studied for more than 200 years. So there's those four basic approaches. I'm putting together um, a whole list of, of remedies and those that they use for HP. I've got this, this is just a page of, from the list showing just a few Remedies, no zodes, for, for a few of these diseases, including malaria and, and, and mumps, pneumonia, polio. Um, and you can see that there's not just that there are many homeopaths who practice homeoprophylaxis who will use only no zodes. That's just fine. There are those who will use only remedies. I prefer to say, well, you know what, let's look at the case and let's find from that or the, what, what, what may be currently presenting, let's find for that what's going to be the most effective approach. I will mention here too, um, what has been found just specifically for, as far as malaria, the nat myrrh that uh, has been shown to be very, very effective prophylactically. Uh, but we now have a malaria nosote. 
And that I've used I've, because I help people travel all over the world with homeo prophylaxis. I've used that for many people as well, too. Uh, Isaac Golden, however, points out that the malaria nosode has been showing to not always be as effective uh, when it comes to specific uh, strains, st specific um, outbreaks of malaria. But the NAPMER is one that can be very effective in many overall cases. The same thing with polio. Okay, the Lathyrus sativus. The polio nosode can be used. However, the Lathyrus sativus nosode is one that from what I've seen, and Dorothy Shepard gets into this in her in her book as well too. In every study that I've seen with Lathyrus sativus, it has been just right around 100% effective when there has been an outbreak of polio. So it's just good to know about the options that are available as far as homeoprophylaxis. Now here is just a bit of documentation as far as a few studies that have been done and I'll, I'll just say um, are still being done because the first one that I'll talk about, well, you'll see, remember that there is no standard dosage in homeopathy and I'll say this too, that there's no standard approach for homeoprophylaxis. So let's look at this as far as the disease and all this. First and foremost, what's on everybody's mind, the COVID-19, and Dr. Manchana got into a lot more detail of it, uh, on this than I than I do here. Um, I just uh, picked out the arsenicum album, and this is the dosing method that I first learned from, I think it was Dr. Karana, uh, the, the current head of um, the CCRH there in India. One pellet uh, daily uh, for three days, followed by once weekly for three weeks. And then once weekly, let's see, I, uh, my brain just suddenly went to sleep. Okay, once weekly for three weeks, or once weekly for a month, or once weekly while the pathogen re uh, remains close by. Again, please refer to um, other doctors, such as Dr. Manchana, who have gotten into a whole lot more detail than I am right here. Okay, influenza affects many, many nations, but we hear our a lot today about the 1918-1919 Spanish flu, where they found the arsenicum album, the bryonia, the gelsemium, all three of those remedies were sh shown to be very, very effective. But uh, further research should be done as far as the dosing that was done for this. The Japanese encephalitis, a 1998 to 2001 study. This was um, a one of the tremendous combination uh, remedy approaches that proved to be incredibly successful. And that's the approach that they use there. Leptospirosis, a tremendous approach used in Cuba in 2007, 2008. Uh, Dr. Brasho and Dr. Golden shared this um, and how they put together the combination remedy for that. And this was simply two doses a week apart. Again, please don't think that this is the only way to be doing things, but this has been found, these were found to be very effective studies, okay? Here's a few select approaches for long-term HP. And keep in mind, we've got the long-term HP, and we've got the short-term HP, which are things for like the flu, things for like if you're going to be traveling. Long-term HP is where you're looking for uh, prevention to cover long-term. A dose is equal to about one to two pellets. And again, please understand there is no standard dosage in homeopathy. Here's the approach that I am most familiar with. This is what I learned from uh, Isaac Golden. And I use it today primarily for HPWWC, but again, this is just a, uh, one approach that has been shown to be quite effective. Those things being at least a month apart in the 200 C potency, month one is a single dose, month two would be a triple dose or three doses within 24 hours. And then you cycle this way through all the diseases that you're desiring to cover and then proceed to a 10 M potency doing a triple dose of that. Okay, and I learned this approach from Dr. Robbie Roy and Carola Lagerroy in Germany. They do their dosings at least a month apart, a single dose um, of a remedy or nozode, although Dr. Dr. Roy prefers to use nozodes in his approach. Uh, single dose of the 200C potency repeated in five minutes. And then this, this coverage is good for about six months. And then a speaker in the Netherlands conference that I had for HPWWC, Dr. Tarako Yui from Japan, she only uses nozodes and she does two 200C dosings in the evening, repeating this annually. And then if there's, here's a couple of uh, dosing approaches to consider if dosing during an outbreak, dose each remedy or nozode, 200C or one or 10M once weekly or monthly until the episode passes, or dose each remedy or nozode at a 30C potency once weekly until 
the episode passes. Again, these, these are approaches used by many homeopaths who are finding effectiveness in these approaches. So you can't really fault any of these. They are what they are using. Now, uh, additional historically documented dosing parameters include these uh, varying ways that Hahnemann described. Hahnemann was big into using a very small dose, a single 30C dose. Okay, practitioners in the British Journal of Homeopathy uh, noted that a 130C or a 200 dose as needed or desired. This was, uh, they, they were able to consult directly with Hahnemann. One of them uh, shares some of Hahnemann's words with him. Practitioners uh, in, in an article by Dr. Grimmer, uh, well, Dr. Grimmer himself shares that a single dose of Atenim would be enough to last for an epidemic. Another uh, woman says that she does three doses of, of the one in potency 12 hours apart. So just to get a flavor of what all is out there. Now, homeoprophylaxis, we need to bear in mind that it is homeopathic, follows the law of similars like cures like, as we've seen Hahnemann even said, it also prevents like. We use the minimum dose. Effectiveness is, again, right about 90%. We need to work within the conventional, or there's that word rational, materialistic medicine, okay? Some homeopaths, today, and I know a few of these, are trying to completely copy what conventional medicine presents for immunization. Now, please understand, uh, the word immunization and the word vaccination are not the same word. Vaccination is a form of immunization, and so is homeoprophylaxis. Please bear that in mind. You are providing immunization for your patients, for your clients, when you are providing them homeoprophylaxis. But unfortunately, uh, those who those within homeopathy who are, who are trying to copy what conventional medicine is presenting are, are, are forgetting Hahnemann's call to strengthen the vital force, to educate the immune system, to honor the divinely created body and its God-given systems. So we need to build on wellness according to the body's innate desire to be well. So just, and I don't get a whole lot into this, but I think you can understand you finding what the history of homeopathy in, in um, epidemics and pandemics anymore. I hope it's not becoming more difficult to find, but in any case, it's, it's there. Dr. Manchanda said at the, the, at the Delhi conference, homeopathy is known today because of how well it works prophylactically. And it also works very, very well in epidemics and pandemics. I just, here's just a page to show you a few of the uh, use, uses a few of the times throughout history, at least the last couple hundred years, where homeoprophylaxis has been used. The very first one, 1799, that's, that's Hahnemann with a scarlet fever mortality less than 5%. And then you can look at the re remaining ones here just on this list to see how effective in every case homeoprophylaxis is. A homeoprophylactic approach, a homeopathic, not just a homeopathic preventative approach, but a homeopathic treatment. Okay, now it's interesting here to note this 1854 London case. I always love to point this out. What, what is good to note about that, that cholera outbreak, that was the first one to have been um, traced to a single source. This was a, a polluted water pump. And so they closed that down and immediately the numbers started de uh, depleting when, when they closed that pump down. And so they, um, the House of Lords asked, for the, the medical hospitals to please share their records. And so they did. And uh, thankfully there was someone there who said, you know what, these are great and good, but where are the records from the homeopathic institutions? Well, they said, we didn't want to share those because those would uh, skew our numbers. Well, the House of Lords said, we need to see those. And so they did. And you can see it was very, very good that they did because you can see that the homeopathic treatment uh, had just a 9% mortality compared to about a 59.2% in conventional medicine. So just bear all this in mind as we're approaching things homeopath homeopathically. Okay, we're in a very unique place today. We need within homeopathy to recognize the value, the need for disease, the, the need to understand what disease is. Okay, but unfortunately the label disease is an allopathic label. Uh, and Hahnemann elucidated on this hundreds of years ago. The predominant thought that we are working with today is the rationalist 
thought. Much good, as I've said, has happened and is being done today because of the rationalist school. Lots of good. I know a couple of heart surgeons. How many lives have been saved because of them? Think about that, okay? Uh, however, many not so good things are also happening because Hippocratic principles are being ignored, being shunned. Holistic principles are being belittled. Now, I don't know that this is as bad as it is within India as it is here in the West. Um, but this is where we are, that uh, the prevailing thought is that something must be defined to its smallest point before something can be done. I think we know different there in homeopathy. So allopathic medicine, again, I don't know how bad this is in India. I don't think it's quite as bad as it is over here. But we are told today that we in homeopathy cannot say that we have a cure for an allopathically labeled condition or disease. We, are able, we cannot say we're able to treat an allopathically labeled condition or disease. We cannot say we can't prevent an allopathically labeled condition or disease. However, homeopathic medicines have been successfully doing exactly this. For symptoms, these allopathically labeled diseases have been presenting for more than 200 years. We must approach homeopathy with great confidence because of its history. As, as uh, Dr. Wanshan had shared, shared we look at the diseases. When people ask, can homeopathy prevent COVID-19? Well, guess what? Homeopathic medicines have been proven effective against every symptom presented by the COVID-19 and have been doing this for more than 200 years. This is what we need to elucidate on. This is what we need to grasp hold of. This is what we need to build on. This is what we have in homeopathy. So, <clears throat> There's not much further to discuss right now at this time as far as homeoprophylaxis, but here's some ideas that I want you to hold on to. Homeoprophylaxis, HP, is designed to strengthen, to build the vital force, and with this, educate the immune system, a phrase that Isaac Golden coined. I love that. I love it. We're educating the immune system. We are working with the body. We're strengthening the individual to learn what it needs to. HP is to help avoid, as possible, diseases that can permanently damage, such as pol uh, smallpox and polio, that can kill, such as meningitis, which can kill within 24 hours of contracting. The conventional approach is, unfortunately, a fear-based approach. Let's avoid disease. But we know so much more within homeopathy, and it's such a good thing that we do. Knowing history helps us actually learn from it and improve where we are today so that home humanity is therewith improved. Again, hardly anything today is actually proven. Almost everything is simply assumptions. The biggest error in every field of science is the fact that so-called knowledge is nothing more than a current theory or model of thought. And this is just a few. Uh, yeah, contact me if you need to. There's HP training if you're interested. Contact me directly, go to one of these websites, you can learn more. There's our Facebook page, which I don't know how much longer it's gonna be there, but it is there right now. Again, here's just a few of the references I used. And again, thank you. I very much appreciate your time and attention. Thank you so much, Kathy, for sharing oh, this great <laughs> information on homeoprophylaxis, its historic roots and relevance. It is very refreshing and enlightening. Being certified HP supervisor, I myself provides homeoprophylaxis following the protocol of Dr. Isaac Golden, and it is very effective. And my family in this 20, past 20 years hardly used antibiotics. So... We know how important is this homeoprophylaxis. And Kathy, would you mind taking some questions, please? Absolutely. I'd be very happy. Dr. Swetha and Professor Regina, please. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for this enlightening uh, uh, webinar and the presentation. We have Pleasure. one or two questions. Uh, first question is, uh, from uh, Uruz Fatima, can homeopathic medicines be used intent of vaccines 
for immunization? The short answer is yes, absolutely. Absolutely, it can be. And this is why, why we have the training in homeoprophylaxis for practitioners who are interested in it. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Uh, other mm -hmm. question is from Dr. Ashok Medan. What is your personal experience for arsenic 30 and doses or some other remedies? Please comment on that. Okay, is this in reference specifically to the, to the COVID-19? I would yes. assume. Yes, that is this, that is a place where I am keeping my door open. To be frank, I live in the Dallas area in Texas, in the United States. And I have heard of and I have worked with a few cases of COVID-19. Uh, and Arsenicum album is has been the primary one uh, that I've been using when people have been requesting prophylaxis for it. And I feel because I've looked into um, Arsenicum album and I, as far as the symptoms that it is good for, and I found that that is, has been the most effective one for me to use. Um, as far as the different cases that I've seen and worked with as far as um, the COVID-19, it, it simply depends on the case. Thank so you I, for answering, ma'am. Uh, and Okay, that's all about the questions and uh, okay. congratulations for the beautiful presentations. Uh, over Thank to you. you, Dr. Kavita, ma'am. Sure, and uh, Professor Regina, do you have anything, please? It was a wonderful webinar. Thank you, Kathy, learned a lot from you. you. And we look Thank forward you. to this uh, homeoprophylaxis with uh, the COVID-19 because it is a very serious pandemic and we're very worried how to treat patients here in South America. Namaskaram, mm -hmm. thank you very much. Namaste, thank you. So no questions, uh, right, uh, Sveta? And yes, if we have many more questions, we will uh, direct to Kathy. They can email us. I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kathy, for your precious mm. time. And we just had from Dr. Manchanda, it was a wonderful presentation. And today, all the audience, they are so lucky to have two speakers with great information. It was wonderful. And um, thank you again, Kathy, for sharing your knowledge and uh, really like the presentation. It's beautifully <laughs> prepared and so happy to see you that is most important in this January to see you too. <laughs> Dr. Isaac Golden, Dr. Manchinda and as you said about Dr. Ravi Roy, Dr. Karola Martin, CCRH team in India and Aish, everyone it was so nice and a great honor seeing all the stalwarts of homeoprophylaxis and we consider today's webinar as tribute to Debbie Brook, homeopath, my dearest friend as it was her birthday yesterday and uh, mm -hmm. we would like to take privilege to honor your gracious presence, Mrs. Lemon, at our study group today with a certificate. Kindly accept oh, thank it from you. our study group. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And um, so on November 15th, we have an uh, Echina webinar with Karen Allen, who speaks about management of thyroid disorders with homeopathy. And uh, I thank sincerely Ka Homeopathy Study Group team for the continuous support. And we have many Ka volunteers with us today. If anyone wants to uh, ask one or two questions, please unmute yourself and speak. And all the viewers, thank you so much. You can ask one or two questions before we wrap up. And we appreciate your presence and undivided attention. And anything else, Dr. Swet and Professor Regina, last few words? Thank you, ma'am. I would like to request all the viewers to kindly fill the jot form, which I shared in the chat box. And uh, you can reach to us, uh, email us at uh, 
kha study group at gmail.com and you can you can follow our uh, different social media platforms like facebook instagram twitter linkedin and over to you regina ma'am yes uh it's a great honor being able to stay with like-minded people and, and we discuss contents like COVID I, uh, and all this uh, because when we get together, we are stronger and we can share what we learn here with our peers and we help society in global and that's wonderful opportunity. Thank you very much. It's a bless. Namaskarans. Thank you so much again, uh, Dr. Manchanda and Kathy. So thousands of people were viewing on the Facebook and many um, more have attended. Thank you and you have received so many appreciations and thank you notes. And um, uh, for more webinars, you can visit us kavitakihomeo.com and as Dr. Sweta has said, castedigroup at gmail.com. And we will bring back again Dr. Manchand and Kathy to our webinars. Until then, stay healthy and happy. Thank you all.